Thank you so much, everyone, for coming today uh, to Knit and Tings, uh, a talk by Lorna Hamilton Brown that marks the closing of We Gather, um, the exhibition that is on display behind us. And today is the last day of the show, which we can't quite believe. Um, I hope you've all seen the show. If, if you haven't, there will be a chance to do so after the exhibition, so please do stay. This show was born out of a research project developed by Dr. Karen Patel of Birmingham City University. Uh, the research really uncovered varying degrees of racism and social inequalities within the craft sector. Um, and as an outcome of that research, Karen commissioned five black and female artists to develop new work for this exhibition, artists that she valued and some of which that she interviewed as part of the process in, in developing the research. Um, and Lorna Hamilton Brown is one of those five artists uh, uh, who were commissioned alongside Oname Otiti, who's here today, um, and Mimi, Amima Madawi Rowling, who's also here today, um, alongside Shaheen Ahmed and Francisca Onima. And together with the curators of the exhibition, Rosie Ross and Griffey, Rosie's here today, um, they've been on quite a journey over the last year in developing or kind of gathering their, their energy, their research and their skills to develop this exhibition with us, um, this urgent and, and critical show and to ensure its, its legacy. Uh, and we can't quite believe it's closing. So many of you know Lorna um, personally, um, if not many of you I'm sure know, know her work already. Um, she's an accomplished artist, a designer and an educator who makes personal, often humorous, but deeply political work that questions ideas of visibility and equity within craft. Um, she's done so much work to ensure that black makers are heard um, and seen in this industry. And she's one of the founding members of the Global Majority Branch, which is a external group that works with the Crafts Council to ensure um, it maintains its commitment to uh, tackling anti-racism as an organization, but also helps to speak to the sector more broadly to ensure that equally it, it, it's, um, it maintains those, those objectives. Um, and so I think it's safe to say that without Lorna, this exhibition would not have been possible. So um, it feels, it feels very, um, uh, that there's no one better place to kind of have the final words and uh, to mark the closing of the show. No pressure there. No pressure there. <laughs> and so on that note, Lorna, over to you. Okay. Well, first and foremost, Thank you to every single person that's given up their time to come and hear me speak. It's very special. I think with the show, when you've seen friends or people that you've met online come and see your work, it just means so much. And secondly, do you like to stand up, Mum? <laughs> Can we just give my mum a round of applause? <laughs> yeah. 91 years young and I just want to honour my mum because the sacrifices that she's made over the years, I wouldn't be the woman that I am or the maker that I am without the sacrifices and the things that she's gone without. So we just give her credit for that, you know, and she's a maker herself. She's a seamstress. You can go and speak to her afterwards, but make sure that when you speak to her, you say, Mrs. Brown, don't get too forward because, you know, it's, it's, it's that generation, you know, so it's Mrs. Brown to you. So she worked as a seamstress. So I always grew up um, with makers in the family and my dad made candlewick bedspread. So I had that kind of background of seeing people making and seeing people making a living making, which is more important because a lot of the time now we see people making and it's a lifestyle and they're not making any money. So today I'm going to, it's going to just be a conversation really. And I want you to feel very welcome. I don't mind taking questions in the middle, but not too many, otherwise we won't get through it. We'll take most of the questions at the end. There'll be time for questions. So I'm going to talk about work that I have in the show. I'm also going to talk about artifacts that are in the show. So if you've had the chance to go around, you'll see some objects and you'll be thinking, oh, I wonder why those are in the show. And so I'm going to talk about those. Um, so 
let's, oh, I know what I was going to do. So this um, slide, does anybody know where, which, where this is from? Well, I'll tell you, it's from a film that I made called Knitting Ain't Whack. And then I was um, a knitting MC. So I thought it's only right that I'll just do a little clip. So I'm Lorna HB, the knitting MC. If you want to learn to knit, you better follow me. And I'm, I know. And it was based on a Victorian rhyme. So when you're learning to knit, just a knit stitch, it's the Victorian, they would teach children to knit by rhyme. So in through the front door, around the back, out of the window, off with that. So I was like, in through the front door, around the back, out of the window, off with that. So I did my own version, but it's on YouTube. So check it out. And it's called Knitting Ain't Wax. So I just thought I'd put that in. Next slide, please. Right. So what I want to talk about is that knitting and crochet, because we need to say knitting and crochet because they are two distinct crafts, right? So right, let's just start off from now. If you want to call crochet knitting, leave now, all right? They're two separate <laughs> things, all right? They're different things, okay? Just nothing more infuriating than people go knitting and it's, they're talking about crochet. So what we have here, because people will say there's no racism in the knitting community. I'm shocked that you can even say that. But knitting and crochet, it just reflects society as it is. So there'll be the good things, there'll be the bad things. So we have here um, the first pattern. And those of you, I know some of you would be offended, but I'm going to say gollywog. We call them gollies now, OK? And so you'll see that there's some patterns over there in the cabinet that refer to that. Because I collect, I'm very interested, I'm one of these like nerdy knitting crochet people. I'm really interested in the, hitting, the history of knitting. So I collect knitting patterns. So in some of my knitting patterns, I don't have this one. I'd like to have that one because I want to extend my collection. But this is in, you know, I've got some over there, which are, are the gollies. And I'm a patron of the Knitting and Crochet Guild. And we've had this, they've had this conversation. What should we do with the patterns? Should we get rid of them all? you know, because they are offensive. I'm like, no, this is, and what I should say, right? I'm one person and there's lots of black people. I know many of them. I've even got some in my family, but the point is, right? We're not a monolith, right? So I'm talking from my perspective, other opinions are available, okay? So they were saying to me, what should we do with the patterns? Should we get rid of them? Should we not show them? So my opinion is they should be shown because it's part of the history. Maybe you want to do what they do at the v &A. So if it's online, you put a notice that this image might cause offence and then you can show the pattern. And maybe don't have them downloadable off of the website, but you know people can go and see the physical things. Because I'm not one for sort of blocking out history. The, it, it, is, it is what it is, okay? So that was that pattern. So I've got quite a lot of those patterns. And um, if you're interested in that side of things, there's a really good book that I'd recommend, and it's called By Golly, and it's The History of Black Collectibles, and it's by Clinton Derricks. And it goes into the whole history of gollies and, you know, how they came about and the people that collect them. So the biggest collector now is Whoopi Goldberg. So she's the biggest collector of gollies because it's charting history. So then when we go on to this pattern here, so we know, so I'll just say the N word, just I'd say I don't offend people. That was a color. The N word brown was a color. And that's just history, just how it was at that time. That was a color. And people would, you know, I, I run a knitting group and the ladies in money, they're in there. Oh, I remember that color. So, you know, it's like, a bit like your color. And they wouldn't see any offense in it because they grew up saying that color. But a friend of mine said a really good thing. And she said, when you have a computer and you know you update the operating system, sometimes we need an update. And you need to say to people, we don't, maybe we did that so many versions down the line, but now we need an update. Okay. And then this one, 2019. So they just felt that they could just do the same thing. You know, so that's, so it's just there. So all I want to say is that the knitter co community reflects society. Whether people are knitting Trump hat or whatever they're doing, it's just a part of society. It's good, the bad, whatever. And that's how it is. So can we go on to the next slide, please? So um, I've, 
did my research when I was at the Royal College of Art. So this is my, this isn't the actual one, but this is a copy. Um, so I was at the Royal College of Art um, 2016 to 2018. I really hated being at the Royal College of Art, but that's not fun today, all right? That was just my experience and I didn't enjoy it, okay? But what I will say to students is, you don't have to have enjoyed something to get something out of it. So that doesn't mean you don't go to these institutions because you still get something out of it. And I learned resilience. So thank you, RCA. But um, while I was there and I wasn't really enjoying my experience, I really put a lot of time into doing my dissertation. So it's Myth Black People Don't Knit. You can see the rest of the title. I won't give you the long title. But why would I do this? So the reason why I did this was because in 2013, at a knitting conference, academic knitting conference, yes, there are such things, knitting in the loop, it was. Somebody said to me, and I was knitting at the time, oh, I didn't know black people knit. Black people don't knit. I was just like, sorry? She goes, oh, I, yeah, black people don't knit, but I'm knitting. <laughs> they crochet, they don't knit. And I'm just like, let's, let's unpick this. So in my dissertation, I tried to unpick it. And I think what she was trying to say is, in the history of knitting, I don't see anybody knitting. It's not documented, so therefore you don't knit. And really, she was right, because we're not really documented in the history of knitting. You know, so in a sense, she was right with what she was saying. So I, I go into um, my research and I look at why do people say that? I look at magazine covers that you don't see any images of black people at that time in knitting magazines, but I'm gonna talk a bit more about that in a minute. And in the, the history, the thing that I found really annoying, so if you read a book on the history of knitting, it will say, the early examples of knitting were found in Egypt or Northern Africa. That's one sentence. In Europe, the whole of the rest of the book is about Europe. There's nothing else about what happened there, okay? And it's just like, you know, what, what went on, you know? And it's like, I've had conversations with my mum, like, did people knit in Jamaica? You know, and it's like us growing up as my generation, we even have to question, did we knit? Because we haven't seen ourselves and representation really, really matters. So we can go to the next slide. So when I was at the RCA, so I said to my tutor, um, could you introduce me to any or tell me of any black knitwear designers? And I was like, oh, can't think of any really. Mm. Jeanette Sloan, one. So I'm on the MA course, specializing in knit, and they can only tell me one black knitwear designer, all right? So I thought, well, I need to meet, meet Jeanette Sloan. And luckily she lived in Brighton, which is near to me. And then we, we met up and look, we're really good friends now. So she, and I was saying to her, what black knitwear designers do you know? So she was like thinking, oh, you know, she's really stretching to think of who they, who they were. And so she put a post on Instagram, how many black knitwear de designers do you know? And it, it started from there. And then people were saying, well, we don't know men and it's really hard to connect. And then the, some Asian, it was going, you think, it's, you think it's bad for you? It's even worse for us. So she wrote this article um, about black people doing it, um, writing about that. And what I think is really interesting is that I've got a copy of um, Knitting, it will be last month now in the cabinet. And the editor has written an article about the racism in the knitting community and how we can do it and how we can make it more diverse. So it's like in the two years when we're calling out these magazines and saying, you need to do better, you need to fix up, okay? That they're actually sick. Because before there was like, don't really say there's a problem, you know? So it's that. So this is a seminal, if you're going to do any research, this is a seminal article because it was in the mainstream knitting magazine, which I would think the predominant, most of the readership would be white. So I think they must probably got, you know, got their copy. I just read it and like, what's going on there? Do you know what I mean? But yeah, so that's a seminal um, article. So if we go on to the next slide. So this was the brief that I got. So Karen Patel, so some of the things that I'm going to talk about, I want you to, when I've done my talk, to go around. So on that video, let's not let's switch off now. But Karen Patel talks about the project. So she was doing research into racism and inequality within the crafting community. And there was a whole debate, it's been going on for a long time, but highlighted, I would say, sort of 2017, 
up to now about the lack of representation, the racism in mostly knitting and crochet. And people are talking about when they go into a yarn shop and then the assistant would be following them like, you know, or just saying to them, oh, we've got acrylic yarn over here, thinking that a black person can't buy the expensive yarn. These are our experiences, you know, or, you know, if you've got the pattern, oh, um, got an easier one over here for you. And all these assumptions, you know, so Karen had charted all these and talking about people's experience. And I'm really pleased that this exhibition is being hosted by the Craft Council. But, right, let's just, let's just be real. If Karen hadn't said, I want to have an art exhibition, it ain't gonna be in the Craft Council. Do you get me? Right, I've been around a long time. I have been, haven't been commissioned by the Craft Council. So I'm glad that they're hosting it. But the reality is it's Karen saying, let's have an art show and we're hosting it here. So I need to put that, that needs to be on the record. So this was the commission. And so, to, so when she sort of said to me, like, we got the brief, I was just like, oh, that's a really big brief. You know, I don't really know what I'm going to do. So I can have the next slide. And my, for me, as a night, my faith is really important. So I, how I work is I'm praying, like, I need inspiration. Lord, just give me that inspiration. And it's like, it just dropped into my head, magazine cover. I didn't know what it was going to be. I just knew I was going to do a magazine cover. So because the work's there, it's just there. We can move on to the next slide, please. Now, as I said, representation really matters. And when I was thinking about magazine covers, I was thinking of this is the pom-pom. And I think this is a seminal cover because this came out when we're having this debate and calling out all these different magazines and saying, you need to do better. They came out with this one. And why this is similar, in my opinion, it's an older black woman, a dark skinned woman, which hadn't been done because where there had been covers, it was very light skinned. So we had that whole thing of colorism and no disrespect to anybody that's lighter than me, you know, but that was the reality, you know. So that was, and I, I, I would say, if you're going to write about knitting, this is a seminal cover. You need to mention that. If we can go to the next image, this is a new one. I've got it here. And this is yarn in them. So this is a black yed, black lead yarn festival. And this was a magazine that they um, printed. And I thought this was quite nice because it's a black man. This is, you know, on the, on the cover, which is quite different, dark skin. So I could pass that around. People can have a look at that if you want. Can we go to the next slide, please? So getting back to the magazine. So the way that I work, I work digitally. So I have an iPad and I draw onto my iPad. So this was like the first sketches that I did on the iPad. I didn't know, I, I was thinking about graphic design and I was thinking, oh, like you could have the text, you do that thing where the text is behind you, all these different things. What am I gonna call it? Can't call it crafts, could call it crafts, these different things. But the things that I knew from the outset was that I wanted Rose Sinclair on the cover. So those of you who don't know, Rose Sinclair, she's a lecturer at Goldsmith College. And I had, um, I'm going to talk about this a bit later, why she's on this. I won't talk about it now because I've got another slide, but I knew that she was going to be on there. I knew that I won't say my name on there because, you know, when people go, oh, I can't pronounce your name. It's really hard to pronounce your name, you know? And it's like, you know, so I, those are the two things that I knew that I wanted on there. I knew that I wanted the Afro hair, the whole thing about our hair and how, it's so important that we can be shown to have natural hair if we want. It's okay if you have your hair relaxed, that's fine. But so often we have to conform to having a certain aesthetic. So I knew I wanted Afro hair. And then I was thinking, Angela Davis, yeah. Part of the people, yeah. You know, we'll have her on there. So there are different things. And I was going to have blue lips and all that at that stage. Because that's, that is how things work when you're working on, you know, the ideas develop. But that was a very... Um, beginnings you know and it was nice drawing and I, I use this thing called paper it's free I like all the free apps and I like that it looks kind of like a watercolor you know it's got that kind of aesthetic so I really like that so I like to show my work and show you the working and all the messiness of it because where I'm dyslexic and maybe I haven't spelt things properly but it doesn't really matter and like we've got um is it say your name I get your name right again Malachi 
It doesn't matter. It's about doing the work. I think as artists, we can be too perfect and we only want to show the perfect things. But Malachi, just show your work, just do your work. I just encourage you. And he's a fantastic artist and doing fantasy drawing. So big up Malachi. I'm going to be on the video now. Okay, so can we go to the next slide, please? So what I'm going to talk about now is the making of the piece. I'll talk about the making of the piece and then I'll talk about the symbolism. So it's made on a knitting machine. And some people go like, oh, it's made on it's cheating. You know, I have that so many times. I do a piece of work and I'm like, cheated, right? But if you do sewing, nobody, when you're using a sewing machine, nobody comes up to you and says you cheated. But you go and use a knit machine, they'll tell you about you cheated. And you know, when somebody says that, they've never used a knitting machine. You know that because you know it's not easy. So the technique to make this piece is intarsia. So every time there's a colour change, you have a different ball of wool. So sometimes I had over 150 wow. different balls of wool. So I want you to see that, to know the work, and that I might be doing maybe six rows a day. A day. Six rows a day. Okay? So it's a really slow process, all right? And it is craft and it is skill, you know? So I want you to see that. So if we go to the, the next slide. So when I was making the piece, I knew that I wanted the person to have a knitted jumper on. But then when I've shown you that I've got 150 ends, if I was going to do the, if you see the jumper there, how many changes there is on the jumper, that would be a nightmare. So then you have to make design considerations. So I thought I need to knit the jumper as a solid colour. I need to knit the knitting. That was a solid colour. And then I need to embroidery on the extra detail. So that was a decision that I made. So um, the circles were embroidered on and then the jumper was embroidered on, the, the detail on the jumper and the barcodes I um, embroidered on after. If we can have the next slide. So you can see, this was like the working process. You could see I was starting to embroider in the, the jumper detail and it was just like, oh, just, it's taking forever. Another thing that I would say about machine knitting or knitting in general, I was having a conversation with a lady about cross stitch. So if you do cross stitch, it's a perfect square. So you're just doing it and, you know, one square, is, you know that it's going to be in proportion. But knitting is not like that because it is rectangle. It's wider than it is tall. So there's distortion. So you have to really make sure that your tension is right. So when I was knitting this piece, I'd never done an intarsia piece across the whole bed. I've always, so it's... 250 stitches. I thought, just go as big as you can. Like, when, is, when are you going to get another commission like this? Go as big as you can. Do the whole bed, right? I've usually only worked in the middle of the bed. So I don't get much distortion. So because I was working across the whole bed, it was really distorted. And I was like, I was saying to my husband, oh, when it comes off, it's going to be wrong. And I've like, I've done, I've done two months now. I, I, I don't know what to do. Should I take it off? You know, but, you know, I thought, trust yourself. Trust, but, you know, I keep looking at it and I was like, oh. Just imagine, like, if I go four months and it's all, there's no time to do anything else, but you've got to trust yourself, you know. So these are some of the considerations that you have to consider. So if we go to the next slide. But when you're doing the task, you have lots of ends. So you, on the back of the knit, you'll have loads of ends. Some people say, well, I wouldn't sew all the ends in, I'll just leave it. For one... In a piece like this, you have to sew the ends in because where the colours cross over like that, if you don't sew them in, you just get a hole. So that's one reason why you need to do it. Sometimes you can, if you're doing um, geometrical shapes, you could maybe get away with it, but here you couldn't really get away with it. And for another reason, I think that the back of the work should be as neat as the front of the work. And I got that from my mum with embroidery. It's just like, you know, she'd turn it over and look at the back and the back has to be neat, no knots, no nothing. So... After I'd finished it, the work, then I had almost another month of sewing in the ends. And those of you who do crafts will know that sometime finishing isn't finishing. There's still another process to do. So if I can have the next slide, please. So this was like the back of the face when I'd like sewn in most of the ends, but it was like it took forever. I was just like, really? So can we go to the next slide. So I want to talk about some of the symbolism in the work. So my work always has symbolism. And I, I think 
that is to do with being dyslexic. It's the way my brain works. I have like, my brain works in storytelling and it works in this means this and that means the other. And there's like an order in my mind when I do my work. And for many years, I would never show that in my work because I, I remember when, like, when I did my art foundation, it goes like, your work should just be able to stand for itself. The aesthetic should stand for itself. You shouldn't be putting meaning on your work. And when I looked at other people's work, they weren't doing that. But as I got older, I just thought, you know what, bun that. I'm just doing <laughs> what I want to do, right? And I'm showing my work the way that I work. And who don't like it, don't like it, because that's the way I work. And I will encourage younger people, get to that point now. Don't wait till 64 to get to that point, okay? So um, if we have the next slide. So this is J J um, James Barnett. I looked at his magazines. He did, these magazines came out in South Africa. They're called Drum. And he'd always have like a black woman on the cover. And there's one like with a lady holding the bird. But they were like just everyday things. And I really liked that idea. So I wanted to bring that into my magazine. So these are research, research that I have done before I finished the final piece. But I'm just showing. So. So it pays homage to him as well, and he's still alive. So I hope that he could see my piece one day. So we go to the next slide. So remember I'm, I mentioned Rose Sinclair. So I knew that she was gonna be on, on this piece. Not only because she has the most, so a lot of what I'm talking about is in a British context, as black British rather than American, because our experience is slightly different. So Rose, I would say is the number one person. If you want to talk about black crafters in the UK, her knowledge is the past. She really helped me when I was doing my dissertation, when you know there was no one at the RCA that could really help me. She really helped me. But I was watching this program with Jenny Sinclair, Craftivism on the telly. And um, I was watching it. And then they had all these different people on the program. And then they had Rose. And there was no mention that she's a lecturer at Goldsmith College, that she's an academic. To me, they just presented her like some next black woman, right? And I was like, what? So now I was just thinking like, this is wrong, you know? And she um, was doing her PhD. Unfortunately, she's been ill, so she has, hasn't been able to get a PhD, but I thought she needs to be honored and she needs to be respected and black women need to be cited, okay? And at the time I did a post on Instagram and I was talking about this and then somebody said, and this sums it all up, somebody said, Oh, I thought she was a volunteer for the Dorcas Society. And this is what happens when you don't credit people. You know what I mean? Somebody just watching it on telly thought, oh, that's a nice black woman. Oh, it's really interesting what she's doing. Oh, really generous. She's an academic at Goldsmiths College. So she was always going to be on the cover. Next slide. <laughs> right, so then it says, if you see the magazine up there, it says, honour that lace, right? The drawing lace. And the reason why that's on there, because I was doing um, research into crochet and I came across this quote. And I was like, what? How could she say that it was of no merit whatsoever? Like there was no merit and it was just like a cheap copy, right? So I thought this needs unpacking, but more importantly, why it's on the magazine cover, who is writing our histories? Because the thing is, even if she, even if we don't agree with this now, this is in the library somewhere, some student gonna go and do their research they're gonna take that as read, all right? And it's who is writing the histories, you know? And the fact is that we know for black people in that time, 1900s, there were laws that they couldn't wear fine fabric. They couldn't wear silk. They couldn't wear different fabrics. It was law. They could only wear the coarsest material. So even if they wanted to do a finer fabric, they were not able to, you know, but these things need to be unpacked. So I'm researching that at the moment. So the paper will be coming out about that to research and unpick this a bit more. Like, let's see an example of this lace. What does it look like? You know, why did she write this? But I found in another book around the same time, 1930 something. And then somebody said, this lace made by blacks rather than Negroes is the best example you can find. So it's like, well, what's going on there? So that needs unpacking. So that, that was going, always going to be on the cover. So that's there. So we can go to the next slide. And then um, at the bottom where I have recipes, you see on there, um, my friend Hilda Pellegrino, she has done these recipes. She started doing recipes in, inside crochet. And she is from the Seychelles. 
And so she's done some of the recipes are from there. And I haven't really seen this happen in knitting or crochet magazines before. The recipes or relating back to black culture, which I think is really important. And I told her, you're a pioneer. She wanted to be here today. So it's on film, Helda, you're a pioneer. And these are the sort of things that need to happen. Not only that we do recipes or we do whatever, let us, if we want to, bring in our own culture into the magazine. So we really have that diversity in the magazine. So that's why that's on there as well. And I will just add something else. If you just look there, because I'm not going to put something. So it's square um, because <coughs> most of the conversation about racism and the equalities happened on Instagram. So it's a reference to Instagram, the square. But there's so much in there. And I want you to go on the website and look because I could be here all day telling you. So we met, right? It's because we make. And somebody says to me, you can't call it we met. People won't understand it. Well, we are reclaiming our language now. So we can say that. So there's a lot more to unpick in there, but I'm not going to go. Oh, well, the other things I'll just say. So where she's knitting, that goes back to my dissertation that black people don't knit. So she's obviously knitting. So it shows that black people do knit. And what I say in my dissertation as well, it's not enough to show a black person knitting. We need to be shown as competent knitters because when you look in books of the history of knitting, and I have looked in them, the last one that I've read on the history, it was by Sandy Black, and she does have a black person in there, and it is a black man, so we have to big her up for that, but he's got two rows of knitting on his needles, and we're always shown <laughs> as beginners. And you know, if you're not black, it most probably doesn't even seem, you'd most probably not even clocking that, but we're looking and like, come on, come on, you know, so that's why, that's there, and the colours reference kente cloth, you know? And so that's where the colours are, but there's a lot more. But as I said, go on the website and have a look, because, you know, this talk is only 45 minutes and we don't have the time. So moving on. So on the back of um, where the magazine cover is, is this piece, I Don't See Colour. And this is a crochet piece, not a knitted piece. Okay, so it's crochet. And it's done in Tunisian crochet, but when we say Tunisian crochet, there's no historical reference to say that it came from Tunisia. Um, the thinking is, is that in Tunisia and in Morocco, men used to knit with hooked needles. So maybe it's that, but we don't know. But it's called shepherd knitting. It's called so many different things, but we'll just call it Tunisian crochet today as a reference. And it's um, a crochet where you keep the loops on the needle. So when you've got it, you have a very, you have a straight, long crochet hook. So it looks like knitting. So if you're doing it on the train and somebody looks at you, you've got all the, the loops still on the needle and people think you're knitting. So it's a mix between crochet and knitting. So I was very interested that in Victorian times, and cotton was cheap, people would use this method to make the ADA. So you know when you do cross stitch, you have that. Is that the right pronounce in the ADA? And you'd, you'd crochet onto this fabric. So they would crochet the fabric. So I thought, that's interesting. And I want to have a go with this. So I've crocheted, I think I've used a 2.75 crochet hook, it's very fine. And then I've done the cross stitch on top, which says black. And the reason why I've done that, I was very interested in these games you get on the Nintendo. Um, no, it's not Nintendo, is it? Yeah, it's a Nintendo. And then you have to say the color, but it's the wrong color, you know? And I was quite interested in it, but it was more about when people say, oh, I don't see color, but, you, but they really do. And I feel that sometimes they're saying that, whereas, so the, the nearer you can be to whatever white is, it's like, we'll see you, because you're not like those other people, you know? So that's, that's how that piece came about. And um, yeah, and I, I, and I like it. Yeah, so it's that, you know, people say, I don't see color. And it's also the thing is, if you don't see color and you don't see me, because I'm not the same as you, you know? And we know that race is a construct and that we shouldn't have to say that we're black or we're white or whatever you want to say but this is a society that we live in. And so I just think, you know, unless you're going to, don't call me the N word, but call me black, call me brown, whatever, but see me for who I am and that my experience is different than yours. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so all right. Next one. So I made this, so talking about crochet, which is interesting because, you know, when she said black people don't knit, they crochet. Who would agree that there's a hierarchy between knitting and crochet and knitting's up there and crochet's there? Who would agree with that statement? Pardon? No, I think knitting is held in higher esteem. 
when it comes to the magazines and the patterns and that knitwear designers get paid more than crochet designers. Let's be real. So there's this hierarchy. So I thought it's interesting that they say black people crochet. So we're doing the one that's down here. Do you know what I mean? So um, I decided to knit these squares, make crochet great again. And it was at a time when a certain person was in power. So you could see where it was coming from. And it was just a humorous thing. And just saying, let's, let's celebrate crochet. And that crochet, for me, should have its own, can have its own aesthetic. Because I see a lot of people now, they're making crochet try to look like knit. You know, but that's just me. So if we can go to the next slide. So in the cabinets, you'll see this Morit magazine. So that's a friend of mine, Alison, has brought out a new crochet magazine. It's high end. And it's, the aim is so that they, ha they have a high end crochet magazine because she felt that a lot of um, crochet wasn't, you know, it didn't have like a Vogue knitting. You know, like Vogue knitting will have some crochet, but she wanted one that just focused on crochet and was high end. And I, I, you know, I applaud that. And I think that there's room for many more magazines. There shouldn't just be one. So that's in the cabinet over there. Right, so we're going to the next one. So this was a piece I made during lockdown. And I sprayed it with water. Um, and it was about, it was when um, George Ford died and I was just thinking about sticks and systemic racism and that it's a web and it's, you can't really unpick it. It just goes into so many different things. So I made this piece and it's crochet and it's done with invisible thread. But the reason why I brought it round, brought it here physically, was when I made it. What did you say, Mum, when I made this piece? She said to me, "Oh, that's exactly, exactly like what your, your, what her grandmother made a piece exactly the same, isn't it?" Yeah, because she used to draw and thread the and drawing. She said, "I'm going to wear it, and she does this and it beautifully." Yeah. So I thought, isn't it interesting? that I, unbeknown to me, have made a piece exactly like my great-grandmother made, so we could pass that around. And when you look at it, you, you might not even think that it's crochet, but I had to use a magnifying glass to do that, so we'll pass that round. Right, so moving on. I'm doing well on time. I'm really good at staying on time. <laughs> so this piece was made in 2011, and it was after the London riots, and I was just like, I was just like, wow, how did that happen? It just happened out of the blue. That's what it's called, out of the blue. But what really got to me was that I felt that youth were being demonised. And it was just like anybody wearing a hoodie, you know, a lot of people just got arrested and picked up just because they're wearing a hoodie, you know, and it was just like they were just standing around. So when I, I wanted the pieces to be life size, so I knitted these two pieces and then I would take it into schools and I say, right, I'm going to show you some knitting. Don't want to see no knitting. Knitting is whackness, and she's just don't want to sit, it's just dry, right? And then I'll take it out and I go, oh, yeah, like that, like that. Then I say to them, what are these two people doing? And then they go, miss, 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 who's got a gun, right? And I'll go, oh, really? And they go, miss, 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 who's got a phone? Now they would say, you know, um, line of duty, burn the phone, but we knew about burn the phone from time. But anyway, they would say, like, he's doing the drug deal, right? And all the things that they were saying was all negative. And I goes, do you know what? They're just standing. They're just standing, right? And let's not demonize our youth, you know? And let's not, as they say, judge a book by its cover. So I thought that that was a really important thing for me at that time, because in the, in the newspapers, everything was feral youth, da 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 da. And I live in Hastings, and they have um, a bonfire society. So every year they will have an effigy that they burn. And that year they burn youth. Yeah, and you're just thinking, what is going on? Yeah, do you know what I mean? I just think, yeah, it's, you're right, it's dark. So that's what that piece is about. And then all the, the yarns, they're all blue, even though the one that looks white or black, they're all shades of blue. And behind it's like the flames. And what's really nice, I have to say, Rosie and Griffey, the two, can you stand up? <laughs> so, come on. They're the, two, they're the two creators of the show, and I have to give them maximum respect because they came out and visit, visited all the artists. And then, as I said, we were commissioned to make one piece. And they go, like, it's massive in here. You can put some more work in. They're like, really? They're like, yeah. You know, so I really thank them that they gave me the opportunity to put more work in. But what they did as well, so the magazine piece was always going to be in because it was commissioned. But they chose the other three pieces, and maybe I wouldn't have chosen them. I'd have like had my twenty dollar bill in. And I'm really pleased with the piece that pieces that they've chosen, and that they um, let us bring 
they wanted to bring in items from our studios as well. So I think that was really important. It's really giving it, giving, giving it the feel of we gather. So maximum respect to them. So moving on. So this is the last piece. So this is Woman Blue Elevate. So, uh, you know, if you've got time, go and listen to the video about the making of this. So this was commissioned by a friend of mine, Felix Ford. And um, she's really, she's, she's a knitwear designer. She can look her up. She does stranded colorway because we don't say fair isle because fair isle is like a region. We say stranded colorway. So if, just to make a point, but um, she's really, her PhD, is in sound, even though she's knitwear designs, is in sound. So she's really interested in sound. And she's interested in punch cards that you use in these mechanical music box. So you turn the handle and it's got, you know, metal fingers and it plays. There's one over there. So she was working with um, a spinner. And I keep saying he's up north and I, I, I checked it this week and he's actually in North Devon. Anyway, John Arben is in North Devon. So it's correct on this filming. And he made a collection of yarn called Yarn Adelic. He's really into music. I think he has his um, record decks in the mill. And so he made this range of yarn and each one is a different song. So Felix was saying to me, which song do you want to work with? So I looked at all of them and I really got caught by this one, which was called Woman Blue, which was um, a blues song. And it's interesting because it's about a black woman, but it wasn't because she was black. I think if she was white, I would have still done it. But it just happened that she was black. So I would, st I would still doubt it because I was just gripped by the story. So the story is, so there's a black girl. She's 18 years old. She's in prison and she sings a song. And a guy that collects folk song is wandering by. I think, oh, that's a really, oh, I love that song. One verse she's singing. And then he adds loads and loads of verses to it. And it becomes this famous song. And um, it's been sung by Joan Baez, Grateful Dead, loads of people. We've, we've never found a recording where it's been sung by a black person. Um, and so I thought, well, I want to make a piece of work to that. So what Felix said to me was, Muriel, who's her partner, has made a punch card that goes into a music box. Can you respond to that? So the first piece that I've knitted, which is the blue piece, which is in the woman blue yarn, because it's called woman blue yarn, I knitted that piece. And I knew that because of the way the punch card, if you're a machine knitter and where the holes were, I knew it was going to be lace. It was always going to be lace. So I knitted that piece and then I've knitted it up and I've turned it around and I've done that with the punch card because how the music had changed with the different verses. And then when I knitted the first sample, which was in acrylic, because who's got money just to be knitting samples in the expensive yarn? <laughs> Let's just be, it's real, real things, all right? Real things. So uh, when I knitted the first sample, I saw there was gaps and I thought, Oh, I could put cables in there. And then those cables would just be where the new versions has come out. So when I knitted this piece, I'd be listening to the music and I just put the cables wherever I think they're going to go. So it was just that responding to, to the music. So I knitted that piece. I knew that I wanted it to be framed in metal because I've done lots of prison visits. And I just think of like, you're always going through, you have metal windows, metal doors. So I knew I wanted it to be framed like that. So I knitted that piece and I, I was really pleased with it. And then I thought, what about that black girl? And I thought, nah, you know? And if, if you look over there, you'll see the, the punch cards that I've done. So I thought, I needed another punch card. So what I did was I wrote out the one verse that she sung. And then I thought, right, I'm gonna make a punch card out of her verse. And so on the machine that I was gonna use, it has 24 holes in the punch cards and the alphabet has 26 but I condensed it down, you know, X, Y, Z into 24. And where the, you can't, when you're doing lace on the machine, you can't have two holes next to each other. So one of the words is mama. So where there's two M's, psh, bun one of those, all right? So just have one M. And then I thought, I'm gonna knit this and it's gonna be her word. So I knitted it and, um, and I turned it around similar to the other one. And I knew I wanted it to be invisible thread. And then I put one, um, one strand of lyrics, which just has a hint of the blue, you know, so you just get that blue tinge, you know, cause I don't want it to be completely visible. I want just that little bit of blue on there. And then the idea is that, and then I knew I wanted it higher than the other piece. So she's elevated. And when you look at, you know, all these versions, you have to look through hers. So it's like, I'm giving her her moment of fame. I'm elevating her and that's, 
that's what that work is about. And I really like it. And what's interesting was um, I knew that I wanted it lit a certain way, but I could never light it that way at home. But here, they just got the lighting bang on because I want you to see every stitch. So have a look at the video, which will go into a lot more detail, but that's just the overview of it. And out of all my work in the show, that's my favorite piece because it's an emotional piece. And I would say it's coming from my belly, if you understand what I'm saying, and it's from my belly out into the work. Right, so can we have the next? Thank you. So that's the, the punch card. So the long one was with the yarn and then the other one is her words. And you can see where I've written it out. You can see my working. And I was just, you, you'll see that pattern there where it was knit to the top for a child in Biafra as it was then, you know. And I just felt that that pattern lacked humanity. I understand what they're trying to do by showing that, but we wouldn't do that now, would we? Showing it in that way. And I collect knitted patterns, and I found this one. It's the same pattern, but it just has a lot more humanity. We could pass that one round than the one shown there. And I just wanted to talk a bit about um, the gollies. So some people would say, um, um, I remember like in my knitting club, one of the old ladies came up to me, she said, oh, you know, I used to love my golly. And I think in a lot of these things, there is nuance. So when she was growing up, that's the toy that she had, all right? That's the knowledge that she had. We could say to her now, well, you know, it's a caricature, it's, you know? So I think we have to look at the nuance in things when we're looking at, at things and be careful that when we're talking to people, we don't condemn them. We should be educating this. And I said, other views are available. We should be educating people, you know, because I grew up, right? And I was collecting the, the, the golly badges on the jam to get the badge, because I didn't know no better. We look at Lenny Henry when he did blackface. So things evolve. So I think we need to give people grace. So that's what I want to say about that. Give people grace. So if we could go on to the last slide. I want to leave this quote. We should know that diversity <coughs> makes for a rich tapestry and we must understand that all threads of the tapestry are equal in value, no matter what the color. And I think that's really important and that we value everybody, you know? And I, I feel that within the knitting and crochet community, we be, I think it's more divided now than it was a few years ago. And I think it's very sad that it is more divided. And I don't know how we come back together, but I hope that shows like this and me, we can look at ways how we can bring, bring it together rather than being separate. And there is a lot of hurt and there is a lot of pain, but if we're gonna move forward, we've got to go through the pain and we've got to get to the other side, you know, and that's going to require grace, that's going to require forgiveness, and that's going to require acknowledgement because people have to acknowledge what's happened as well. So that's where I want, oh, the next slide, you can have my details if you don't have them, but I'm, I can take questions or comments.